Today's first presentation will be from John Atkinson and Jeff Carmichael at Chroma Technology. John Atkinson has been an engineer for 20 years and has a wide variety of skills and experience with optics, imaging systems, electronic displays, astrophysics, and optoelectronic devices. For the past seven years, John has been designing filters and doing product and process development. Jeff Carmichael is Chroma's Director of Marketing. He began as an application scientist, troubleshooting fluorescent imaging applications and recommending products for custom applications. He has also worked in business development. John Atkinson will begin their presentation. John? Thanks, Lisa. Um, I wanted to start this off by talking about the coding process, specifically reactive magnetron sputter deposition coding, which enables advanced coding design. Sputter deposition is a physical vapor deposition or PVD process where material is physically removed from a target and deposited onto a substrate. It does this with high energy ions from a glow discharge plasma to dislodge the atoms from the target. Ions are used because they can be accelerated in electric fields. In magnetron sputtering, magnets are used to make the plasma more dense, thereby concentrating the energy. For most optical coatings, we want a dielectric or oxide material. In reactive sputtering, the targets are metal or semiconductor, and oxygen is introduced during the deposition and reacts with the metal, thus forming the oxide. For example, tantalum pentoxide, aluminum oxide, or silicon dioxide. In addition, ion guns can be used to add energy to the process and promote better film growth. So what are the benefits of sputter coating and what characteristics of sputtering, specifically in this case reactive magnetron sputtering, lead to what advantageous coating properties and resulting performance benefits? I split this into two categories, process characteristics and physical characteristics. Just as an example of each, Take first the process characteristics around thickness control. This allows for complex coating designs, for example, those with needle layers, uh, very thin layers in the coating. These designs can be highly optimized with computational algorithms. This in turn means we can create an optical coating with very precise spectral performance, such as narrowband filters, notch filters, or even filters that match very closely to a, a CIA CIE color function. Under physical characteristics, this high energy dense plasma uh, with relatively low pressure leads to a very dense and clear coating. This in turn leads to high transmission, low scatter, very durable coatings, both in terms of environmental robustness and or high laser damage thresholds, which allows for products to be used in harsh environments. So now I'm going to go through the basic process for reactive magnetron sputtering. So first we have the chamber layout here. Uh, you can see the substrate um, and the targets in their res respective cathodes. Chamber starts off obviously filled with air. Um, next we uh, apply um, a substrate heater to add a little energy to the glass, to the surface. Um, you can see here the glass is now spinning around. That's to uh, improve the uniformity of the coating. And you can see the optical monitoring system, uh, which provides feedback for the deposition in terms of an optical signal, which ultimately is what matters. So now we see here the high index material is uh, going. Uh, sputtering begins, the power supplies go on, and in this case, ionized argon forms the plasma. The sputter material moves along a ballistic path between the target and the substrate. Uh, at low pressures, the atoms carry almost all of their original energy to the substrate. The, sputtering, the sputtered atoms form a vapor cloud or deposition cloud, which then condenses on the substrate. And here it is for the low index material. Note also there is an ion gun, uh, which is doing two things here, providing oxygen uh, to form that oxide. Uh, the O2 is reacting with the metal at the substrate. But also, 
the ion gun gives a little boost of energy to help promote the dense film growth. And then I wanted to briefly touch on interference, which is really the core physics of how these optical coatings work. So here you can see a thin film stack, uh, which is alternating layers of high and low index material of varying thicknesses. Um, interference, which is part of the wave nature of light, uh, is where light waves are destructively or constructively uh, interfering, thereby transmitting or reflecting particular wavelengths of light. The structure of the stack could be repetitive or in a pattern, like with a simple quarter wave stack to make a mirror or an edge filter, like a long pass or a short pass, or as in a fabry perot interferomic bandpass filter. For more efficient designs, a more optimized stack, sometimes uh, including very small needle layers, as I mentioned before, can be used. And uh, with computational optimization, you can make really complex designs that allow you to have um, really advanced uh, spectral characteristics. And now I'm going to turn things over to uh, my colleague, Jeff Carmichael, to uh, continue the presentation. Great. Thanks a lot, John. So now that John's told you about the sputter coating process, I'll illustrate for you uh, some of these process and coating characteristics that sputtering enables that I've highlighted here on this slide. Um, because sputtering can provide such precise deposition rate control, it enables the use of comp computational optimization that John mentioned, approach, the, these sorts of approaches that John mentioned when designing optical coatings. Now, I'll come back to this idea in a couple minutes, but first let's look at some examples of spectral plots of optical filters. So here's a simple example of two bandpass filters manufactured by the reactive sputtering process that John described. The graph on the left plots the theoretical transmission spectra of the coating designs of these two filters. So in order to read these spectral plots, you just need to understand three things. First, light is a spectrum of wavelengths. On this graph, they span from blue to red. These wavelengths are represented on the x-axis and expressed in units of nanometers. And the other two things are the transmittance, which is represented on the y-axis, can be expressed as either transmission or as optical density. Now, transmittance is the measure of the effectiveness of transmitting radiant energy. And in the cases we're considering today, this means that transmittance is the efficiency of passing light through a filter. So the convention is that when the fraction of the light passing through is between 1 and 100 percent, we call this transmission. When the transmission of a filter drops below 1 percent, the convention is to express this in terms of optical density. So transmission and optical density both refer to transmittance just on different scales. Optical density is calculated as the negative log of transmission. So at 1% transmission, the OD equals 2. At 0.1% transmission, the OD equals 3, and so on. So this slide illustrates both transmission and OD plotted together, uh, which allows you to visualize the blocking slope. Um, I'll return to this later. I just wanted to show you an uncluttered example of this type of plot first. Um, so here are some spectral plots of manufactured filters overlaid on the theoretical spectra of the measured spectra of five independent manufactured production runs of each filter. Note some of the characteristics that I highlighted earlier, which are illustrated here, such as high levels of transmission, um, a relative lack of ripple and square wave passband shape in good agreement with the design, and the repeatability of execution. Um, the way these filters work is that the, the excitation filter on the left transmits light that we see as green light onto a fluorescent sample, and the emission filter on the right transmits emitted fluorescence that we see as yellow light. Now, we don't have time to go into the details of the fluorescence phenomenon, but as long as the green light from the excitation filter is excluded or blocked from the detector by the emission filter that transmits yellow light, then the filters are doing their job. So this slide illustrates the optical density of these filters 
and they match that of the theoretical design up to about OD6, six and a half or so, where it becomes noise limited as it reaches the limit of sensitivity of the spectrophotometer. Um, and in this side, slide, which is, again, just displaying both OD and transmission, you can see that the, f the filters are mutually exclusive of each other up to the noise limit. We call this blocking, and we say that the emission filter blocks the excitation filter. What's not obvious here is why this is necessary. So the difference in brightness between the excitation light incident on the sample and that of the emitted fluorescence in one of these applications, it's, it's similar to this. It's similar to the difference between the lux from the noonday sun in early summer and a dark, moonless, starry sky. So this is, it's, it's approximately quantitative um, in comparing the brightness of the excitation light incident on a fluorescent sample and the fluorescence emitted from the sample in a microscopy application. So this difference can cover a wide range, but it's often a million to a billion fold, and, and it can be much greater. Um, so optical density is extremely important in many fluorescence applications. Now this slide is sim similar to the one I just showed you, except you can see on the, on the y-axis, it plots optical density up to OD15 to illustrate the depth of blocking that the design predicts. In reality, the actual OD is somewhere between the noise limited measurement and the design, and it gets us into the neighborhood of where the blocking needs to be for the application. The other thing to note here is the parabolic-like arc of the blocking slopes of each filter on each side of the passband. This is a telltale signature of the classic Fabry-Perot type of design John mentioned. These designs can execute very robustly. They give you this sort of overreach of the near band blocking, and they work great as single pass band designs for many applications, including this fluorescence application. But this also brings us to another important point, which is that one of the limitations of these designs is that they're subject to the whims of the natural harmonics that are present in the design. And these harmonics determine the wavelength ranges where transmission naturally wants to occur and other ranges where it doesn't want to occur. Um, so if you want to design a multiband filter like this with transmission at a point that goes against the grain of what the coding wants to do, you need to try another approach. And that's what computational optimization allows. It, it provides the flexibility to create more challenging and complex designs and to optimize a design independent of harmonic constraints. But this requires a coding process that can be exquisitely tuned um, by precise deposition rate control. That's what reactive sputtering can provide. It allows for the creation of more challenging designs like this one. Um, this multiband filter was designed to be optimal for the application, and it required this type of computational design approach. And it, it, this is a beautiful filter. It executes amazingly well in both transmission and here in optical density, um, as you can see from 10 independent coding runs over a two-year period. So here are some notch rejection filters as examples of the use of these so-called needle layers that John mentioned. The coding design for the 785 nanometer notch filter, let's see right here on the far right, here are four different notch filters. The black trace contains over a thousand layers. Um, most of the material is in thick layers, and these alternate with extremely thin needle layers, which get coated very quickly because they're so thin with very little material. Now, it's critical when shooting these needle layers that the coating rate is known precisely and that it's controlled precisely, because what are otherwise very small errors in coating thickness become relatively large errors for a layer that's so thin. So having this ability to precisely execute these very short duration layers allows one to make filters that couldn't be made otherwise. And here's an example of the exact same filters plotted in optical density. Um, finally, let's take a quick look at some photometry filters intended to model CIE color functions or color spaces. These are used to calibrate displays like smartphones or televisions, and they mimic human photopic vision such that 
their use ensures that the display is calibrated to the way the human visual system sees and experiences color. They're not complex designs, but the execution is key here because in order to precisely match these curves, it's critical that layer thicknesses are exactly what they need to be. And this ensures the level of transmission at each discrete wavelength is exactly what the design requires. Otherwise the shape is off, the spectrally integrated transmission is different and it no longer matches photopic vision. So that, those are the examples I wanted to show you today. Um, thank you very much.